Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God, back with you with the next video in my series reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. He is so jolly green, said Charlie when he recovered, as an apology to the company for his unpolite behavior. The Dodger said nothing, but he smoothed Oliver's hair over his eyes and said he'd know better, by and by, upon which the old gentleman, observing Oliver's color mounting, changed the subject by asking whether there had been much of a crowd at the execution that morning. They made him wonder more and more, for it was plain from the replies of the two boys that they had both been there, and Oliver naturally wondered how they could possibly have found time to be so very industrious. When the breakfast was cleared away, the merry old gentleman and the two boys played at a very curious and uncommon game which was performed in this way. The merry old gentleman placing a snuff box in one pocket of his trousers, a note case in the other, and a watch in his waistcoat pocket with a guard chain round his neck and sticking a mock diamond pin in his shirt, buttoned his coat tied round him, putting his spectacle case and handkerchief in his pockets trotted up and down the room with a stick in imitation of the manner in which old gentlemen walk about the streets any hour in the day. Sometimes he stopped at the fireplace and sometimes at the door, making believe that he was staring with all his might into shop windows. At such times he would look constantly round him for fear of thieves and would keep slapping all his pockets in turn to see that he hadn't lost anything in such a very funny and natural manner that Oliver laughed till the tears ran down his face. All this time the two boys followed him closely about, getting out of his sight. So nimbly every time he turned round that it was impossible to follow their motions. At last, the dodger trod upon his shoes, upon his toes, or ran upon his boot accidentally, while Charlie Bates stumbled up against him behind, and in that one moment they took from him, with the most extraordinary rapidity, snuff box, note case, watch guard, chain, shirt pin, pocket handkerchief, even the spectacle case. If the old gentleman felt a hand in any one of his pockets, he cried out where it was, and then the game began all over again. When this game had been played a great many times, a couple of young ladies called to see the young gentleman, one of whom was named Bet and the other Nancy. They wore a good deal of hair, not very neatly turned up behind and were rather untidy about the shoes and stockings. They were not exactly pretty, perhaps, but they had a great deal of color in their faces, and looked quite stout and hearty. Being remarkably free and agreeable in their manners, Oliver thought them very nice girls indeed, as there is no doubt they were. The visitors stopped a long time, Spirits were produced in consequence of one of the young ladies of a coldness in her inside, and the conversation took a very convivial and improving turn. At length, Charlie Bates expressed his opinion that it was time to pad the hoof. This is, this, it occurred to Oliver, must be French for going out, or directly afterwards. The Dodger and Charlie and the two young ladies went away together 
having been kindly furnished by the amiable old Jew with money to spend. There, my dear, said Fagin. That's a pleasant life, isn't it? They have gone out for the day. Have they done their work, sir? inquired Oliver. Yes, said the Jew. That is, unless they should unexpectedly come across any. When they are out, and they won't neglect it. If they do, my dear, depend on it. Make them your models, my dear. Make them your models, tapping the fire shovel on the hearth, to add force to his words. Do everything they bid you, and take their advice in all matters, especially the Dodgers, my dear. He'll be a great man himself, and will make you one too. If you take the pattern by him, is my handkerchief hanging out my pocket, my dear? Said the Jew, stopping short. Yes, sir, said Oliver. See, if you can take it out without my feeling it, as you saw them do, when we were at play this morning. Oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand, as he had seen the Dodger hold it and drew the handkerchief lightly out of it with the other. Is it gone? cried the Jew. Here it is, sir, said Oliver, showing it in his hand. You're a clever boy, my dear, said the playful old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head approvingly. I never saw a sharper lad. Here's a shilling for you. If you go on in this way, You'll be the greatest man of the time. And now, come here. I'll show you how to take the marks out of the handkerchiefs. Oliver wondered what picking the old gentleman's pocket in play had to do with his chances of being a great man. But, thinking that the Jew, being so much his senior, must know best, he followed him quietly to the table and was soon deeply involved in his new study. Chapter 10 Oliver becomes better acquainted with the, characteristic, the characters of his new associates and purchases experience at a high price, being a short but very important chapter in this history. In this history. For many days, Oliver remained in the Jew's room, picking the marks out of the pocket handkerchief, of which a great number were brought home, and sometimes taking part in the game already described, which the two boys and the Jew played regularly every morning. At length, he began to languish for fresh air, and took uh, reg and took many occasions of earnestly entreating the old gentleman to allow him to go out to work with his two companions. Oliver was rendered the more anxious to be actively employed by what he had seen of the stern morality of the old gentleman's character. Whenever the Dodger or Charlie Bates came home at night empty-handed, he would expatiate with great vehemence on the misery of idle and lazy habits, and would enforce upon them the necessity of an active life by sending them supperless to bed. On one occasion, indeed, he even went so far as to knock them both down a flight of stairs, but this was carrying out his virtuous precepts to an unusual extent. At length, one morning, Oliver obtained the permission he had so eagerly sought. There had been no handkerchiefs to work upon, and the dinners had been rather meager. Perhaps these were reasons for the old gentleman's giving his assent. But whether they were or no, he told Oliver he might go, and placed him under the joint guardianship of Charlie Bates and his friend the Dodger. The three boys sallied out, the Dodger with his coat sleeves tucked up and his hat cocked as usual. Master Bates 
sauntering along with his hands in his pockets and Oliver between them, wondering where they were going and what branch of manufacture he would be instructed in first. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.